Sugar began with a private investigator named John Sugar searching for a Japanese boy named Yuma. That night, he visited a Japanese man's apartment in Tokyo and asked the Japanese man to tell him where Yuma was. He said that he could flee the country if he gave him that information. He warned him that he was going to be in a big trouble since Yuma was the son of a Yakuza leader. But instead of giving John the information he asked him, that kidnapper attacked John and injured his hand. Fortunately, John managed to defeat him and find Yuma and that kidnapper's wife inside a cupboard. Not long after that, the Yakuza leader who hired John arrived in that place and paid John. After that, John returned from Tokyo to Los Angeles. This time, he was hired by a man named Jonathan Siegel. When John got out of his car, he suddenly had a headache. He couldn't even move his hands for a while. It wasn't revealed yet about what illness he suffered from. A woman named Ruby showed up and greeted him. Ruby was John's handler. Turned out, before John went to Ruby's house, he met with Jonathan Siegel, the man who hired him. Jonathan was a legendary film producer. John admitted that he was fond of Jonathan's works. Ruby said that she didn't like John meeting with Jonathan. As his handler, she thought that John needed to discuss about this matter with her first. According to their agreement, John was supposed to take some rest first after he finished doing his job in Tokyo. John said that he couldn't reject Jonathan's offer because he needed his help to find his 25-years-old granddaughter, Olivia Siegel, who had gone missing for two weeks. Jonathan showed Olivia's picture to John. He revealed that Olivia went missing for several times because of drug-related problems, but she still contacted him during her disappearances. This time, he worried about her because of her lack of contact, especially to consider that she looked happy, confident, and in a better condition when he met her last month. He even remembered that she had never touched alcohol and drugs anymore. For that reason, Jonathan asked John to help him to find his granddaughter. He said that she meant everything to him. John agreed to accept his offer because Olivia reminded him of his sister, Jen. After Ruby heard that, she finally understood. She knew that John had never brought a gun when he was on a mission. But this time, she forced him to bring a gun. She explained that that gun was not a random gun. It was a revolver who was once used by Glenn Ford in the Big Heat. She also said that John needed to ride a classic fancy car. Without wasting more time, John rode his classic car to go to the expensive apartment where Olivia lived. When he arrived there, the apartment manager, Gary, greeted him and showed him Olivia's car at the parking space. They checked the computer data and found out that that car hadn't been used for two weeks. After that, John began his investigation at Olivia's apartment. As a private investigator who had been working for years, he paid attention to everything in that room, including the little details. He believed that everything, no matter how small it was, mattered and could help him to find out about what happened to the missing person. While John was investigating that room, a man named David Siegel and his bodyguard, Kenny, came to that room and pointed a gun at him. John tried his best to get calm. After he introduced himself to them, Kenny finally stopped pointing his gun at him. Turned out, David was Olivia's stepbrother. He said that he could access that apartment by using the key that his father gave him. He thought that Olivia was a drug addict who couldn't be saved. John began to suspect him after he heard that. He thought that David was not supposed to say that because Olivia was his stepsister. He believed that there was something that David was trying to hide. He decided to investigate him because he thought that he might have something to do with Olivia's disappearance. John found a picture of Olivia's late mother, Rachel Kia, from when she was a young actress. He looked at that picture and concluded that just like Olivia, Rachel was a sad and lost person too. He continued to search Olivia's apartment and found a picture of Olivia and Melanie Matthews. He recognized Melanie as a famous rock star. Turned out, she was also Olivia's stepmother. John then decided to go to the bar where Melanie used to hang out. When he arrived there, he saw a homeless man named Carl and his dog. He approached Carl and gave him $200 and a phone. He asked him to call him soon if he saw someone trying to steal his car. Carl immediately agreed to do that. It was not every day that a random person would give him $200 just to watch his car. John then went inside the bar and saw Melanie singing there. He approached her and introduced himself to her. After that, he and Melanie had a drink together. John hadn't revealed to Melanie about the reason why he came to see her yet. Melanie enjoyed talking to John because she thought that he was not a playboy. She thought that John was a private man who only told his life story to those he could trust. John then decided to give Melanie a ride. When he walked to his car, he gave his phone to Carl to thank him for watching his car for him. He also gave him a ticket so that he could go home. At home, Melanie asked John to make love to her, but John rejected her sexual advance. After Melanie fell asleep, 
John left his picture and business car on the desk to tell Melanie about the reason why he came to see her. When John walked to his car, he found out that Kenny was following him. It wasn't revealed yet about the reason why Kenny was following him. John approached him and gave him the address of the hotel where he stayed at. When John returned to Olivia's apartment, he went to the parking space and checked Olivia's car. This time, he didn't use an iron ruler anymore to open the car door. With his phone, he finally managed to open the car door. After that, John downloaded the tracking system in Olivia's car to find out about where Olivia had been. He was surprised when he found a man's corpse inside that car. That corpse had a big body like a bodyguard. John worried that he would find Olivia's corpse next. He then returned to his hotel and installed some security cameras there. Suddenly, a waitress came to his room and gave him a letter from Cosmopolitan Polyglot Society. It wasn't revealed yet about what Cosmopolitan Polyglot Society was and what John had to do with it. John searched through the suitcase full of memorabilia dedicated to Rachel that he found in Olivia's room. He read an article and found out that Rachel, Olivia's mother, died in a car accident. John worried that just like her mother, Olivia died in a car accident too. He also found compromising pictures of Rachel in that suitcase. He wondered if those pictures had anything to do with Olivia's disappearance. Suddenly, John saw blood coming out of his arm. It appeared that the wound in his shoulder had reopened. The next morning, John met with Bernie Siegel, Olivia's father and Rachel's former husband. Bernie was working as a film producer too, but he was not as successful as his father. He didn't seem worried or surprised about Olivia's disappearance. He believed that his daughter would return home for drug rehabilitation. He also said that he knew that John was having fun with his former wife, Melanie, last night. John then showed him the compromising pictures of Rachel that he found in Olivia's suitcase. Bernie denied that he was the one who had taken those pictures. He said that he was betrayed by Rachel, but he refused to elaborate what he meant. John suspected that there was something that Bernie was hiding from him. He thought that it might have something to do with Olivia's disappearance. When John returned to his hotel, he saw the CCTV footages of David and his bodyguard Kenny sneaking into his room and concealing a listening device there. It seemed that they had no idea that they were dealing with a professional and smart private investigator like John Sugar. After that, John met with Olivia's friends to find more information about Olivia. He also talked to Olivia's drug dealer. After interrogating them, he concluded that Olivia had changed into a better person and didn't consume illegal drug anymore. After that, he came to see Jonathan and told him about what he found about Olivia's disappearance so far. Even though Olivia was a drug addict, Jonathan still loved her so much. He even loved Olivia more than he loved his grandson, David, because he was stupid. He revealed that David was the son of Bernie and a woman named Margit. He said that Margit was a horrible woman. After John heard that, he wondered if John's family problem had something to do with Olivia's disappearance. He thought that anything could happen and that it was his job to solve this case. According to the data that he retrieved from Olivia's car, he found the location of a woman named Carmen Vasquez, who was a victim of recent rape and murder. He found out that Olivia's car was found at the crime scene when Carmen was murdered. He assumed that Carmen's murderer was Clifford Carter, the dead man found in Olivia's car. He checked Clifford's criminal record and found out that he was indeed a criminal who had involved in rape, assault, and human trafficking case. Jonathan was surprised when he heard that. He asked John to dispose of Clifford's body to avoid implicating Olivia in the crime. Later, John met with Melanie again. Melanie asked him to see her because she wanted to tell him something about Olivia. John asked her why Olivia always visited her every night a week before she went missing. It seemed that just like Bernie, there was something that Melanie was hiding from John. John then showed her the picture of Clifford. Melanie said that she didn't know him, but John didn't believe her. He asked her if she helped Olivia to disappear or if Olivia was already dead. Melanie refused to answer him and told him to leave her house instead. Before leaving, John planted a GPS tracking device on Melanie's car. While he was heading to his hotel, he noticed that a car was following him. He remembered that it was the same car that he saw before. Suddenly, he saw Carl's dog crossing the road. He then got out of his car to find Carl, but he didn't see him there. He tried to contact the phone that he gave to Carl another day but nobody answered his call. Even though it was not his business, he decided to trace Carl's location and visit the motel where he stayed at. With the help of the hotel staff, he managed to have access to Carl's room, but when he entered that room, he found out that Carl had died due to an overdose. He found out that Carl was using the money he gave him another day to buy that illegal drug. Turned out, another man was hiding in the bathroom. 
John attacked him as he thought that that man was Carl's drug dealer. After that, he left that place and took Carl's dog with him. He visited Ruby and asked her to take care of that dog. But since Ruby had a cat, he finally took that dog home. John also asked Ruby to trace the car that followed him earlier. He believed that there were other people who were involved in Olivia's disappearance, but he was not sure that it was the Seagulls family. After that, John tried to dispose of Clifford's dead body, but when he returned to the car, he found out that Clifford's body had disappeared. He checked the trunk and found two strands of hair there. He carefully retrieved those strands of hair because he believed that it would lead him to something. Apparently, Bernie had been ordering David and Kenny to find everything about John. He didn't care if John was hired by his father Jonathan. A woman named Teresa Vasquez and her children returned home. But when they arrived home, they saw a gang of men waiting for them there. That gang was led by a man named Byron Stallings. Byron was a friend of Clifford. He came to that place to find Clifford because he heard that Clifford slept with Carmen, Teresa's sister. Since Carmen was dead and Clifford was nowhere to be found, Byron showed Teresa the picture of Melanie and asked her if she knew that woman. He thought that Melanie might know something about Clifford's disappearance. The next morning, Melanie visited Teresa's apartment. She went to that place after Teresa called her and told her that there were people who asked her about her and Carmen. Turned out, it was Byron's strategy to trick Melanie into going to Teresa's place. A man in a green t-shirt who was sitting in his car saw Melanie arriving in that place and entering Teresa's house. Melanie was surprised when she saw Byron and his gang in that place. She knew that she couldn't run away since that place had been surrounded by them. John was heading to Teresa's apartment building after his friend, Charlie, contacted him and told him about where Melanie was. Turned out, he had asked Charlie to follow Melanie. When he arrived there, he got into Charlie's car to spy on that place. He found it suspicious that an expensive car like Ford getting parked in such humble environment. He was getting even more suspicious when he saw a man in a green t-shirt spying on that place too. He worried that there was something dangerous was going on in that place. For that reason, he finally decided to go inside that apartment building. At Teresa's place, Byron asked Melanie to tell him where Clifford was. Melanie swore that she didn't know where Clifford was even though Carmen was her friend. John checked the list of the apartment residents and saw the surname of Vasquez. He remembered that Carmen had the same surname. He then decided to go to Vasquez's room through the back door. But suddenly, he felt immense pain in his body due to his wound. Byron thought that Melanie was lying to him. He threatened that he would put Teresa's hand into the blender if she didn't tell him about the truth. After a while, John finally found Teresa's room. He entered that room and pretended to be a parole officer. But Byron didn't believe him because he noticed that John was wearing an expensive suit and watch. Suddenly, he received a call from his subordinate. He panicked when his subordinate told him that a smoke came out of his Ford. Turned out, Charlie was the one who did that. She managed to distract Byron and his gang by using a smoke bomb so that they wouldn't find out about John's real identity. A Byron subordinate pointed his gun at John, but John managed to defeat him and save Melanie and Teresa. The three of them then ran away from that place. Byron was angry because a smoke came out of his Ford. He took his anger and frustration at his subordinate, calling him useless and didn't know how to work. Charlie took Teresa and her children with her meanwhile John took Melanie with him. Byron had just realized that the smoke that came out of his Ford was only a smoke bomb. Kenny asked his friend, a man named Everett Roberts, to help him to find information about John Sugar. Everett found out that John was not married and that John's father had passed away. He also found out that John was a polyglot and that he once joined the army. He suspected that John once joined the special forces or worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as an international spy. Melanie finally revealed everything to John. She said that she was a volunteer who was working at a women's shelter, a place of protection and support for women escaping domestic violence. After she helped Teresa to escape her abusive husband, Carmen contacted her and asked her to help her because she suffered from domestic abuse too. Melanie said that Olivia also helped her that she and Carmen became close with each other. She remembered that one night she visited Carmen's house and saw Olivia crying with a gun in her hand. She was horrified when she saw Clifford and Carmen lying dead on the floor. Olivia said that she went to Carmen's house because she was unable to contact Carmen. She claimed that when she arrived there, she saw Clifford carrying a body bag. She was surprised when she saw that. She saw a gun near the fireplace and grabbed it right away. She confessed that she shot Clifford with that gun because he tried to assault her. Even though what she did was an act of self-defense, 
She refused to report this incident to the police because she didn't want to ruin her family's reputation. Having no idea about what to do, Melanie and Olivia finally decided to take Clifford's dead body to Olivia's car. Melanie said that it was the last time she saw Olivia. She admitted that she didn't know where Olivia was right now. Ruby's computer detected that Everett had logged into John's account. Ruby found out that Everett was a member of National Security Agency. Since John didn't have a wife and a child, Everett thought that the only weakness that John had right now was his mother who lived in Arizona. In the evening, John attended the party that was held by Cosmopolitan Polyglot Society. Ruby was the one who hosted that party. There were about 20 people who attended that party. Just like John, those people came from prestigious background. It seemed that they were international spies who were sent to work in various countries. One of the people who attended that party was Henry, John's old friend. John approached him and talked to him. Everyone who attended that party took turns going upstairs and giving their latest report to Ruby. After a while, it was John's turn to see Ruby. John gave Ruby the journal that contained his latest report on the case that he was investigating. On the same desk, there were still more journals that contained all other agents' latest reports. Ruby criticized John for investigating the Siegel's family's case too deeply. She reminded him that his job was just to spy on them. In another place, David also gave his latest report on John to his father. He told Bernie everything that he knew about Cosmopolitan Polyglot Society. It was rumored that the members of that community were international spies who worked in service of an overarching mission, which was to make the world a better place to live in. Ruby called someone and warned him that John was going to be in a big trouble because of Byron since he was one of the most dangerous killers in the world. At night, Melanie visited Bernie's secret house. Ruby finally decided to erase Byron's records from her database. After that, she typed everything that all her agents kept in their journals, including their personal secrets and their latest reports on the cases they were investigating. John visited Dr. Vickers to check on his health condition. He had him took his blood so that he could have a blood test and find out about his health condition. He worried about his health because his hand had been trembling lately. David and Kenny decided to go to Arizona to visit John's mother, Helen Sugar. Helen was glad to see David there because she recognized him as an actor. She greeted David and Kenny and allowed them to go inside her house. Bernie told his recent wife, Wendy, that he didn't return home last night because he worked all night at their beach house. John called Ruby and asked her about Byron. Ruby lied to him by saying that Byron was only an ordinary criminal who had never committed any serious crimes such as kidnapping or human trafficking. John was confused when he heard that. He thought that that information didn't make sense. It wasn't revealed yet about the reason why Ruby lied to John about Byron's real identity. After David and Kenny found the information they were looking for from Helen, they finally left that place. They had no idea that the woman they were talking to was a spy who was sent by John to pose as his mother and trick David. John finally arrived at Melanie's house. Melanie remembered that she once saw Olivia having a conversation with a woman at a cafe. John and Melanie then decided to find information about that woman. They asked everyone who worked near that cafe and showed them Olivia's picture. At a clothing store, they finally managed to find information about the woman Olivia was talking to. They found out that Olivia had a friend named Taylor. They then visited Taylor's apartment and asked her about Olivia. Taylor claimed that she first knew Olivia from her Instagram post. She admitted that she was sick of seeing Olivia helping women to escape domestic violence. She revealed that she once auditioned for a role in film that was produced by Bernie. She said that she met David there, who promised that he would help her. But turned out, David sexually harassed her and blackmailed her instead. He showed her the video of them having sexual intercourse that he took secretly by using a hidden camera. He threatened that he would upload that video on internet if she refused to have sex with him any time he asked her. Taylor said that she had tried to report him to the police, but the police didn't do anything to help her because the Siegel's family was a very wealthy and powerful family. Bernie even sent a lawyer to ask her not to talk about this case anymore, but Taylor refused to do it. Taylor said that there were other victims of David and Olivia was aware of it. John and Melanie were surprised when they heard that story. They wondered if Olivia's disappearance had something to do with Olivia being aware of the crimes that David committed. Later, John called Jonathan and asked him to meet with him. Jonathan gave him a ticket and asked him to attend the premiere of the early film that he produced. While Jonathan was busy with the premiere, John talked to David's mother, Margaret. After that, he tried to find David, but he didn't see him anywhere. He then approached Bernie and warned him that David would receive a serious consequence for what he did to women. Not long after that, 
he saw Melanie sending a text message to Bernie. It wasn't revealed yet about what Melanie and Bernie were talking about and why Melanie was hiding something from John. Through the security camera, John saw Melanie was mad at Bernie about something. The film that was produced by Jonathan was finally played on the big screen. After it ended, Jonathan was asked to go to the stage. Suddenly, an article about David being a sexual predator who had sexually harassed many women was published. Everybody was shocked when they read that article, especially Jonathan. While David was reading that article, he suddenly received a call from Byron. It wasn't revealed yet if David and Byron worked together or not. John tried to ask Jonathan about that article, but he was unable to do that since Jonathan was sent to hospital due to heart attack. Byron padlocked a cellar and ordered his men to find information about John. Before leaving, he asked his subordinate to stay there and watch that place. John looked at Rachel's picture and noticed that the gold dress that she was wearing in that picture was the same dress that the lead actress in the movie was wearing. He wondered how Rachel could have that dress even though that movie was made 30 years earlier. Byron's subordinate found a necklace and wore it. That necklace was the necklace that was usually worn by Olivia. It seemed that Byron was keeping something important inside the cellar he had padlocked. David was devastated by the sexual abuse allegations against him. Instead of telling David to take responsibility for the crimes that he did, his mother, Margaret, asked him to forget about that problem. David was the only son in the Siegel's family right now, which meant that he would become the heir. Margaret told him to ignore what everyone in that town thought about him. John went to Jonathan's house to see if he could find more information to solve this case. While visiting that place, he saw the gold dress that Rachel and the lead actress worn in Jonathan's personal archives. After that, he visited Jonathan in his room, but he hadn't regained his consciousness yet. Suddenly, Bernie came to that room and told John that he would give him some money if he stopped investigating Lydia's disappearance. John refused to accept that offer. He said that he wouldn't stop investigating this case unless Jonathan asked him to do it. After that, he tried to find David there, but he didn't see him anywhere. He then went to Margaret's house to find David. Margaret told him that David was not there. John didn't believe it since Kenny was the one who opened the door for him. Margaret then played the victim by saying that David was depressed because of the false accusations that those women made against him, but he still empathized with them. John noticed that Bernie and Margaret didn't care about Olivia who still went missing. Margaret asked Kenny to make John leave that place, but Kenny was scared to do that. He was intimidated by John after he read his records and found out about who he was. After a while, David finally came out of his hiding place and met with John. John asked David to tell him about where Olivia was. He didn't care about what problem that David was facing right now. David finally confessed that he had been in contact with Byron, the criminal who provided and sold women for human trafficking. All this time, David had been hiring Byron to deal with women who could ruin his family's reputation and his film career. Those women were the women who had been sexually abused by David. David admitted that he told Byron about Olivia too. John was angry when he heard that. He was disgusted by the crimes that David had committed. He was tempted to beat him up, but he tried his best to get a hold of himself. He asked David to tell him where Byron was right now, but Byron said that that criminal was currently in Tijuana, Mexico. John was disappointed at David. He thought that as her brother, David was supposed to protect Olivia. Instead, David put Olivia in danger by hiring a criminal who committed human trafficking to hunt her down. Ruby went to a forest and met with Miller, another member of their organization there. She said that she worried about John who was investigating a case that could put him in danger. It wasn't revealed yet about what Ruby meant by saying that. Miller asked Ruby to stop John from looking more into the case by doing whatever was needed. After Charlie escorted Melanie home, she stayed in her van and watched that place through the security cameras. She had no idea that Byron's subordinate had been waiting for Melanie inside her house. He threatened Melanie and asked her to tell him about Clifford. Suddenly, Melanie attacked him. After that, she ran away from him and hid inside the bathroom. Not long after that, John arrived in that place. He wanted to make sure that Melanie's escort went well. John and Charlie were not aware that Melanie was in danger. But when John was about to leave that place, he heard something from inside of Melanie's house. He then checked on Melanie and began to brutally attack Byron's subordinate. Fortunately, he still managed to get a hold of himself that he didn't kill Byron's subordinate. After that, he asked Melanie to stay with him at his hotel because he worried about her safety. In Mexico, Byron was picking up some Mexican pretty women to be sold. Surprisingly, David attempted to commit suicide by shooting himself in the head. 
His parents were shocked and horrified when they found out about it. They immediately called the ambulance and took David to hospital. At hospital, the doctor told Bernie and Margit that David managed to survive, but his brain was severely injured and couldn't be treated. It meant that David wouldn't be able to talk, move, or even think for the rest of his life. Bernie and Margit were devastated when they heard that. Meanwhile, John was waiting for Charlie to call him and inform him about what she had found while spying on Byron's house. Byron finally returned to the United States. When he arrived home, his subordinate told him that they hadn't heard anything from his other subordinate who was tasked to capture Melanie. Byron was confused when he heard that. After John heard that Byron had returned, he headed to Byron's house and told Ruby about his plan. When he arrived there, Charlie warned him that Byron had two aggressive watchdogs and many weapons. Before leaving, John asked Charlie to call Ruby if he hadn't returned in 10 minutes. When John was about to enter Byron's property, two aggressive watchdogs approached him and barked at him. But fortunately, he managed to tame those dogs. After that, he entered Byron's house and saw a woman with a cover on head sitting on a chair. He thought that that woman was Olivia, but turned out it was a trap that was set by Byron. Suddenly, Byron showed up in that place and began to beat John up. John didn't attack him back. He begged him not to use violence because he just wanted to know where Olivia was, but Byron and his subordinates refused to listen to him. Because of that, John finally decided to attack them. Unfortunately, he was stabbed in the stomach in the process. John pointed his gun at Byron and asked him about the person who told him about his arrival. He found a text message in his phone that told him to leave because he would arrive in that place. John asked him again about where Olivia was, but Byron refused to tell him. John then decided to kill him by shooting him in the head. After that, John searched that house to find Olivia. He thought that Olivia was being held captive in a room there, but when he opened that room, he only saw many dogs there, including Carl's dog. Not long after that, Byron's subordinate arrived in that place. He was surprised when he saw Byron and his subordinates lying dead on the floor. John said that he would spare his life if he gave him his phone. He worried to use his own phone because he believed that it had been hacked. He then tried to call Charlie by using that man's phone, but she didn't answer him. For that reason, he assumed that Charlie had been captured. After that, he called Melanie and left that place. He tried his best to ride his car even though he was badly injured. Bernie visited his father and told him about what happened to David. He poured his heart out to him, showing him about how devastated he was. He thought that it was better for David to die rather than to live in pain. After a while, John finally returned to his hotel. Melanie was surprised when he saw him getting badly injured. John asked her to call his friend, Henry. Not long after that, Henry arrived in that place and treated John's injury. He prepared a bag of blood that contained the symbol of Cosmopolitan Polyglot Society on it and transferred the blood in it into John's vein. Once John's condition was getting better, Henry asked Melanie to look after John. At night, John finally regained his consciousness. When he woke up, he saw Melanie falling asleep he then left that place quietly and went to Ruby's house. John was mad and disappointed at Ruby. He knew that she was the one who told Byron about his arrival. He asked her about the reason why she did that. Ruby said that she told Byron to leave because she didn't want John to get wounded. John asked her where Charlie was, but Ruby said that she didn't know. Ruby said that they wanted John to stop investigating Olivia's disappearance. John was confused when he heard that. He asked Ruby about the people she was talking about and why they wanted him to stop investigating this case, but Ruby didn't answer him. While Ruby was taking a spear in for him, John decided to leave that place. He was disappointed at her because she was the person he trusted the most in this world, but now she betrayed him. He finally decided to continue investigating this case, even though there were people who were after him. When John returned to his hotel, he injected himself with a mysterious intravenous substance. All of a sudden, he transformed into a blue-skinned humanoid. Ruby opened her suitcase that contained a strange device that looked like a typewriter. Miller was in that room too and watched her. While Ruby was typing a message, she asked Miller not to hurt John. It wasn't revealed yet about what she meant by saying that. At hotel, John finally woke up from his sleep. His health condition was better now. Melanie asked him about what actually happened, but John refused to tell her. The Siebel's family was attending David's funeral. Since his son died, Bernie began to worry about Olivia. He also regretted that he didn't care about Jonathan sooner. Apparently, Olivia was still alive. She was being held captive in a dark basement. It wasn't revealed yet about who had kidnapped her and why they did that. While John and Melanie were having a conversation at hotel, 
Miller suddenly came to that place and asked John to let him in. Even though Miller was his superior, John refused to meet with him. Miller finally decided to break through the door and attack John. He managed to overpower John easily by grabbing his neck and lifting him up in the air with a single hand as if he was a superhuman. Fortunately, Melanie helped John by knocking Miller over with a towel bar. After that, she and John ran away from that place. When they arrived in a safer place, John finally told Melanie that he was working for a secret organization. Melanie thought that he was a spy because he could speak many languages and he knew how to read other people. John refused to talk about his job in detail, but he said that his job was only to spy on people. He worried that Henry would become the next target, so he decided to go to the university where Henry was working at. He tried to call Henry, but he didn't answer him. He became even more worried about him because of that. Turned out, Henry didn't answer John's call because he was teaching in class. He didn't hear his phone ring. By the time John and Melanie arrived in the classroom where Henry was teaching, Henry was already gone. John checked Moss's phone and read some text messages there. Moss was Byron's subordinate who was beaten up by John another day. After John read those text messages, he decided to go to Moss's house. But when he arrived there, he found out that Moss was already dead. He regretted his death because he thought that he could help him to find Olivia. At night, John followed Miller to Ruby's house. When he entered Ruby's house, he saw other polyglots already gathering there, including Henry, who turned out to be all right. They said that they needed to return to their own planets now because their mission was over. It was revealed they were not ordinary humans, which explained why John transformed into a blue-skinned humanoid earlier. John refused to return to his planet because he hadn't finished doing his job, which was to find Olivia. He insisted on staying on that planet until he managed to find Olivia. Suddenly, Henry told him that he knew where Olivia was. He wrote an address down and gave it to John. He also told him that some people on Earth already found out that they were not humans. He warned him about those people because they were very powerful and they could destroy them whenever they wanted. Apparently, the person who kidnapped Olivia was a senator who happened to be Byron's client. Henry said that they were angry at John because he had murdered three people, including Byron, and that was the real reason why they needed to return to their own planets now. Henry also revealed that the reason why Ruby asked John to stop investigating Olivia's disappearance was because he had ruined their real mission, which was spying on humans on Earth. Since they were aliens, Henry worried that they would be in danger if more people found out about their existence. After that, John visited the address that Henry gave him. While he was searching that house, a security guard named Ryan suddenly caught him. John told him that he came to that place to rescue a woman named Olivia, who was being held capture there, but that security guard didn't believe him. He handcuffed John and went to the basement to find out if what John said was true. John looked at the family picture in that room and realized that that security guard was the son of the senator himself. Ryan returned from the basement with a hammer in his hand. He planned to use that hammer to attack John. He had no idea that he was dealing with an alien. Even though John was handcuffed, he managed to overpower Ryan. After that, he went to the basement and found an array of torture and slaughtering devices there and stacks of recordings. He took one of those recordings and continued to search that room. After a while, he finally found Olivia inside a locked cabinet under the stairs. Melanie was surprised when John called her and told her about what happened. She was happy and relieved to know that Olivia was still alive. John wondered about the content of the recording that he took from the senator's basement. While Miller was driving, a police officer suddenly stopped him and shot him to death. On his last day on Earth, John visited Henry and asked him to lend him a CD player. He and Henry also talked about the senator, who turned out to be a psychopath who had tortured and murdered many people. In his car, John played the recording from the senator's basement. He heard Ryan's confession and the victim who was going to be murdered by him. After a while, John finally arrived at Jonathan's house. Jonathan wanted to hire him as the chief of security with interesting salary, but John politely declined that offer. John was happy to see Olivia returning home safely and reuniting with her father. He then showed Jonathan the compromising pictures of Rachel, Olivia's mother, that he found in Olivia's suitcase back then. Jonathan was surprised when he saw those pictures. He revealed that he was the one who took those pictures. He admitted that he had a short relationship with Rachel, Rooney's first wife. It explained why Rachel was wearing the same gold dress that was worn by the lead actress in Jonathan's movie. John didn't want to know if Olivia was Jonathan's granddaughter or daughter because he thought that it was not his business. What was important to him was to know that she was loved by her family. 
Ruby called John because she worried about Miller who hadn't shown up at the departure point yet. Before returning to his own planet, John decided to visit Melanie first. He held her hands and revealed his alien eyes to her. Melanie was surprised when she saw those eyes. She finally realized that John was not a human. Even though what he did was breaking rules, John was happy to let Melanie know that he was an alien. Ruby called John again and warned him about the criminals who were after him. John played the recording from the senator's basement again. While he was listening to that recording, he realized that Ryan was not alone in torturing and murdering his victims. John then decided to return to Jonathan's house to talk to Olivia. Olivia remembered that while she was being held captive in Senator's house, there were two people there and one of them had been writing all the time. John played the recording again and realized that what Ryan said was the same with what Henry said. Not long after that, he received a call from Henry. Henry confirmed that he was Ryan's accomplice and that he did it to learn from humans. He said that he would stay on Earth even though there were people who were after them. John followed the rose petals that led him to a cupboard. When he opened the cupboard, he found the clothes of Jen, his sister, there. He was surprised when he saw it. He wondered if his sister was still alive and was on Earth, and if Henry was the one who abducted her. John finally decided to stay on Earth to find his sister, Jen. He understood about all consequences that he would receive from doing it. After that, he went to the departure point and said goodbye to Ruby. 